I was born in 1964 um, on a council estate in North London where I grew up and went to the local primary school, um, was very lucky. I went to a very good secondary school. It started off as a grammar school when I first arrived, but it was the time when those changes were happening. So by the time I left, it was a comprehensive. Um, I then went to the University of Sussex, uh, did a degree and PhD there, and eventually turned up at Imperial College as the Lloyds of London Tercentenary Research Fellow, a mouthful, in 1993. And I did two years on a fellowship. Um, I was appointed to a lectureship and then, you know, did the progression of academic progression. Um, I became a director of undergraduate studies in the chemistry department. And at the end of that um, was when I became head of the chemistry department. Did that for seven years, then became dean um, of the faculty for five years step down from that this Christmas in order to make space for becoming president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. So I came out when I was at the University of Sussex in, do you know, it's so long ago, I have to, I think it was 1984. <laughs> so I was, you know, I was, still, I was a PhD student at the time that I came out. Um, and, you know, the world was a very different place then. Um, there was a lot of open hostility, uh, you know, it, people would be frightened to walk down the street hand in hand. Um, you know, the government itself was attacking us. Um, it was the, you know, the AIDS epidemic was starting to kick off in a, in a serious kind of way. So that was the kind of environment that I came out in. Um, and uh, fortunately, though, I was at the University of Sussex, which meant I was living in Brighton which was just an amazing piece of luck. And it was luck more than judgment. I didn't deliberately go to Brighton because it was one of the three great gay towns of the world at that time. You know, there was um, obviously San Francisco, Amsterdam and Brighton were the places where you could walk down the street holding hands without getting beaten up. My experience has been, I think, lucky. Um, because really thinking hard, I think the anything which is in any way limited my career, or I mean, obviously not that much because it's gone pretty well, <laughs> so it's not been that limited. Uh, anything that's, that's that's kind of been more a drag on my career, or where I really sat up and thought, hang on, I think I've just been offended. Um, has really been much more to do with the fact that I was from a working class background than the fact that I am gay. So that's just the honest truth. Um, and, and also, I think, all the, I'm not for one minute saying, oh, I arrived at Imperial in the land of milk and honey and my life was perfect. But the contrast between the treatment of me at Imperial College and my friends and colleagues and lovers outside um, the world of, certainly the world of Imperial College and really the world of academia was quite stark. You know, I do have friends who were simply sacked because they were gay. I do have friends who were taken off of high profile projects in their companies because they were gay. I do have friends who were assaulted at work because they were gay and the person that assaulted them wasn't sacked. I didn't have that experience at Imperial College. You know, by the time I arrived at Imperial College, I'd already been out for a decade. And, and so I arrived with the level of confidence that gives you. I arrived with the, you know, the stroppiness that that gives you. Although my coming out was never stroppy, it was, I mean, and again, very lucky in that, you know, my now husband um, is a very charming and lovely person. And so, I didn't often come out by saying to someone, I am gay. I most often came out to someone by saying, let me introduce you to my partner, Mike, who was charming and lovely and, and so difficult to react against. <laughs> the college community is showing itself, deliberately is trying to show itself to be more open and more accepting of difference. 
trying to be more visible. And so the rainbow lanyard is, you know, um, and, and it's getting, it's kind of bizarre really. So I now, I do not view somebody wearing a rainbow as being an indicator that they are LGBT. <laughs> and, you know, when it first started, I, you know, I came along to a few meetings. I've done, you know, did a few things um, with it. Um, but I was starting to become at that stage quite a senior figure in the college. And one of the one of the things that one of the very strange things that happens when you become something like a head of department is you realize that you've become the person that has to leave so the party can relax and enjoy itself. You know, you're too much, you've got too much of a label of boss over your head. And so, you know, I very deliberately at that point thought, do you know what? They don't want me haunting this place. You know, I'm here, I'm available, people know who I am. And over the years, people have said, can you come along and do this? And whenever anybody said that, I'd said, yes, of course I can. But I, you know, I, I, I've, I've thought that in many, in many of, over many of those years, actually my presence as clearly a member of the senior management might actually be a bit inhibiting. And so in that regard, you know, that's uh, my association with it. And, you know, and has it made a big difference to me in the sense that um, I live my life any differently? No, because by 2006, I was, you know, such a well-established old queen that, you know, it just, it was just, you know, there was nothing to change. <laughs> it's, I think it's true of anybody who wants to be an ally of any community of which they are not part is listen, just listen. Don't, you know, either inside your head or, or out loud, dismiss something that you think might seem to you to be trivial, but is important to the other person. And, and I think that that is the, the most valuable thing any ally can do. Um, and, and actually, I would say slightly from our part, you know, when, so when, on occasion when you are having a discussion with someone. Um, I think one of the things that's very easy to slip into, or certainly for me it is anyway, is to say either inside your head or out loud, you are homophobic, as opposed to that thing that you have just done is homophobic. And, and it's a very subtle difference, isn't it? But I think it kind of, um, it, it, it avoids backing into corners and and allows for an open discussion um but yeah absolutely the first job of any ally is to listen um and you know and my experience you know i i always say this is my experience and i accept it's mine and it might be different to different to yours and that's from within the community so what i would say is um one don't worry about being in the sciences you know we're we have all the same statistics as everybody else where these things are concerned um two so, so for me and 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 you know this was right at the heart of the start at work i'm i, I guess i am more moderate <laughs> but i really am a camp old nelly and in order to cover that up i had to do a great deal of emotional work it wasn't an effort to bring all of myself to work, I think is the expression we use nowadays. It was an effort, it was an effort not to. And I could choose to put that energy into pretending to be someone I wasn't, or I could put that energy into being a better, well, better person, but all that energy into being a better scientist. And the right place to put that energy was into being a better scientist. And if that meant that, yeah, again, one of the things not only do I say about myself, but my friends have said of me over the years, Tom, you're not out. What you are is effing obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and to not put energy into not being effing obvious gave me extra energy to put into being good at what I did. The way you can best advance your career is by not putting effort into pretending to be someone you're not. So given, given the things that I've just said, maybe it won't be quite so surprising. So I would like to put a word in for those early out queers, because that's probably what they would have called themselves, 
you know, the people who ended up being vilified by us, you know, the, the Larry Graysons of the world, um, the Kenneth Williams of the world, uh, the Charles Hawtreys of the world, these people who were camp, you know, they were camp. There was this hideous, hideous backlash against them, sort of in the 1980s, in the, you know, the kind of, the don't frighten the horses version of the, the LBGT um, community of, you know, suddenly we had to drop all of that and we all had to start going to the, the gym and butch it up. And, and those people who were absolutely, you know, they were so courageous being themselves and we vilified them. And that is appalling. And so, so they, they kind of remain heroes of mine. I kind of hope in the kind of, you know, the modern way of viewing gender fluidity, um, that people like that can be brought back into our fold um, as, you know what, yeah, it's, it's, just, just be who you are. And if you are a camp old Nelly, be a camp old Nelly. So of all of your questions, this is the one that I find most difficult because it depends where I am. Here I am in central London, one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. My life is easy. But if, you know, so many countries across the world, you know, in, still in the majority of Commonwealth countries, it is illegal to be gay. And in three of them, the punishment is death by stone. Yeah, you know, what I would, the change I would want is the change that has happened for me since I was young, to happen for everybody.